Coming up on Digital Music Trends 230 on the 29th of April 2015, Pandora and the CRB rates, should Tidal take some time to figure out its next move, the European Copyright Directive and the Digital Single Market Initiative, Jukli's $8 million fundraise and much more. This week's show is brought to you by Gramophone, a small device that can turn your traditional sound system into a Wi-Fi music player. The Gramophone relies on your home Wi-Fi rather than on Bluetooth, which allows for higher sound quality. You can send your music to the Gramophone right from the Spotify app. And from that moment, the device will bypass your phone and stream directly from the Spotify servers, which means that your phone won't run out of charge and you'll be able to receive notifications and calls without interrupting your music experience. We thank them for the support of Digital Music Trends. Check out the website on gramophone.com. Hello everyone and welcome to Digital Music Trends. I'm Andrea Leonelli and this is the weekly show where we talk about and try to make sense of the latest news in the digital music industry. And this, as I mentioned in the past couple of weeks, is sadly the penultimate show of uh, DMT on a regular basis. So after the first week of May, the show will no longer be weekly, but it is very likely that the odd show will come out every once uh, in a while. And so if you'd like to keep up to date with those one-off episodes, you should sign up to the newsletter on bit.ly slash DMT list. Once again, it's not going to be a weekly newsla- newsletter, so it's not going to clog up your inbox. But if you would like to keep up to date with those one-off shows, so that's probably the best way to do it. And this week, it's a real pleasure to welcome to the show Sophie Gussons, a media tech and entertainment lawyer based in London and Paris. So hi, Sophie, and thanks for joining me. How's it going? Hi, Andrea. It's going very well. Thank you for having me on the show. It's great to have you. And it's also a pleasure to welcome back Darren Hemmings, uh, founder of digital marketing agency Motive Unknown. So hi, Darren. Thanks for joining me. And uh, uh, very sad to say that it's, uh, it's our last appearance on the show before uh, we break out with the, the, the weekly, regu- uh, you know, the regular uh, release of DMT. I know. I, I'm, I'm, I'm sad. <laughs> This is a, this is a, it's a, it's a, it's a shame. It's the end uh, of an era. It's, it's the end a, of an era. You know, you're moving on to, to uh, fine and prosperous things. So it's understandable, yes. but <laughs> it's a shame. So it's nice to be here, but it's with a, it's, it's with a, a tint of sadness. And thank you so much for your contributions over the last uh, uh, couple of years. It's been, oh, it's been a blast, really good mate. fun I've having you on the show. A, I've had a ball. I've loved every single one. Especially the ones where I swore a lot. That was quite good. <laughs> Sitting around last FM. Those were definitely appreciated got by it, the got audience. a little bit blue. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> And let's start at this week's show by talking about Pandora. So we talked about Pandora a lot over the last few years, obviously, and the company continues to uh, be a bit of a, a financial question mark. Uh, the results for Q1 of 2015 are in. They were released uh, uh, just a couple of days ago. And they highlight that uh, obviously the company is doing well. Uh, it keeps adding new users. Uh, uh, revenues grew 18.8% uh, year on year. Uh, listener, listening hours grew 11%. But at the same time, the listener growth is flattening, flattening out, and so uh, it, it is struggling to add uh, more uh, listeners uh, year after year. And uh, on the other hand, uh, the losses uh, widened uh, to 48.4 million for the quarter. Uh, and you know, this is a difficult path uh, towards profitability for Pandora, and it's dependent on a number of different issues uh, and complex uh, rate setting procedures. Uh, one of of which is actually happening this week. So the Copyright, copyright Royalty Board proceedings uh, also started uh, this week. It's going to be a five week long process uh, where three judges uh, are going to pre- preside this trial uh, that will decide the rates that companies like Pandora are going to have to pay between 2016 and 2020. Uh, so uh, Sophie, on your side, do you think that, uh, how do you feel about Pandora as a company? And also, how do you feel about the uh, CRB uh, proceedings that are going to set the rates for the next five years? It's going to be really, really interesting to see what those uh, CRB proceedings will um, give birth to. Uh, I mean, a few comments on my side is that I find it fantastic uh, or quite astonishing to see a company that is so massively uh, successful with its users that is still not able to turn out a decent profit. Right. Um, but I, I, I'm probably not the first person who is uh, <laughs> seeing that. Yes, and, absolutely. And not the first person who is commenting about that uh, on your show, certainly not. Um, so yeah, it will be really interesting to see. I think w- what we can... Um, 
what we can see from the CRB proceedings is that it's going to be a really tough negotiation with, on one hand, Sound Exchange, who is going to advocate for a higher rate, and on the other hand, um, obviously Pandora is going to advocate for lower rates to yeah. be able to turn out of a profit. And there is also um, uh, another issue, I think, which is really interesting to look at. If you look at what's happening with um, that five weeks trial is that in the US there is another debate at the moment, but which is very much connected with the debate around the rates. It's the debate about terrestrial radio. Yeah. Um, so a few weeks ago, I think it was, uh, there's been a, a lot of conversations happening around another act, which I think is called the Fair Play, Fair Pay Act, Yeah. Um, which is not an act yet. Obviously, it's just, it's a bill that's been proposed uh, that will try once again to make sure to, to have terrestrial radio uh, pay for the broadcast of sound recordings. Yeah. And obviously artists and record companies, when they see the amount of money that is now being distributed through sound exchange, um, that amount is quite important. I believe that there's more than one billion who's been paid by sound exchange um, during the last uh, distribution. Yeah. Uh, and this is significant amount of money. So I think that probably a lot of the rights owners are also seeing that if you can make so much money through sound exchange only for the uh, digital radio services, they are probably uh, looking as well, well at the, the amount of money that could be made if the um, terrestrial radios were starting to pay yeah. into that same system. And I think it's interesting to see, and again, I don't know all the specifics because I, I'm not... Uh, um, as familiar with the American system, but in the Fair Play, Fair Pay Act, there is a demand from the uh, people who have drafted the bill to um, establish a minimum fee to be paid by each type of service that plays music. Yeah. And that would have some consequence on how the copyright royalty board can decide on the rates. Yeah. So I think it's just really interesting to see how everything is moving at the same time, how everyone is trying to push its agenda. It's fascinating to watch. And one other uh, observation that I think that I, I would make is that the CRP, CRB consultation or the CRB decision, uh, when we will know it, could also have another consequence. Uh, and that other consequence could be that Pandora would be driven to make more deals with the rights owners direct. Yeah. And that's if the, uh, if the rates are really not um, in Pandora's favor anymore. If the rates are getting way too expensive, at least in the eyes of Pandora, too yeah. expensive uh, in, in, in their opinion, they might want to um, try a different strategy, a strategy that they have not been willing to engage with recently, but they might want to or have to uh, engage in another strategy, which would be to make deals with the rights owners direct. Yeah. Um, obviously, I have no insight as to uh, how that would go the yeah. only thing that i would say is that maybe this would allow pandora to launch outside of the us which for uh, many many users who have been enjoying pandora when they were in the us and i can't uh, as one of the people who really loved the service when i uh, happened to spend some time in the us um, it, it could very well be a uh, um, a development that that we could see in the next years or so. Yeah, absolutely. No, absolutely. Uh, and, and Darren, on, on that front, you know, it's, it's a very good uh, sort of uh, segue from that, talking about the fact that Pandora, obviously a, a big company, uh, not, you know, in terms of revenues is not uh, huge. Perhaps, you know, uh, uh, Spotify may well surpass it in terms of, in terms of revenues uh, over the next year or so. But as far as, uh, uh, you know, 
the company itself do you think that the the the, the real issue here lies in the fact that it's it is stuck in the US to, to a certain extent and it doesn't have any uh, other large markets wh- where it can expand and and, and on that point uh, if it can make direct deals that that could actually prove to be the key to to try and get out of it yeah I mean I think there's certainly a chance for them you know if they could make those direct deals um, then there is a possibility there and I would imagine at some point that growth and that scale will be desired by the people that have put money into Pandora you know the investment investors and backers um, I mean it's a you know it's an interesting case study isn't it as to whether Pandora is too big to fail yeah you know where they've reached that point where it's in nobody's interests for them to totally collapse and it, it, you know and this is it feels like there is now something of a standoff as to whether you know the 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 rights holders will really put them over the barrel relative to the increased payouts or whether they will draw a line and accept that they've taken this as far as they can go i mean it's it's very interesting isn't it because it's it is just where uh, they're prepared to draw the line against innovation and things like that, whether they will go the whole hog and choke out the market in favour of seeing another one rise up that may pay in a, a better manner, yeah. or uh, whether they accept that that's the, the, you know, the limit and that they have to settle for what's there. And yeah. it's a, you know, I think it bears an interesting parallel to what we're seeing with the whole freemium argument and, you know, and the way in which Vivendi are leaning on Universal to you know equally then lean on spotify and you know uh, uh, but within all of that and that desire to chase the the extra money that they fear they can get if they force people onto premium it's just whether that's realistic in the cold light of day yeah. you know whether if they do this you know that's been the the question is if universal forced spotify to be a premium only platform would that hinder the growth of streaming would it you know lead to a surge in piracy again and all those sorts of things and i think there's a good number of parallels between those those issues and and what we're seeing with Pandora relative to its ability to survive. And obviously, you know, if if Pandora decides to expand internationally, that that requires an additional expense, and so that would also make a further dent into its profits. And so it's kind of the chicken and egg there of investors probably wanting them to expand uh, internationally, but also being wary of the fact that if it does, uh, then it's going to take them another ten years to turn a profit. <laughs> yes, and that, but that's. Uh, and equally, I mean, I think Pandora are interesting to me because they have an extremely high number of users. And I think there's a, a, a something of an unanswered question relative to Pandora as a radio service and the on-demand audio streaming services as to the adoption of them by the, the you know, the mass of Joe Public, not just uh, slightly more ardent music fans. You know, and this was something I was talking about in last night's Daily Digest was kind of, you know, if you can find the all the people that only buy one album a year, you know, the people that bought the Adele record kind of thing, you know, that would yeah. only yeah. spend, you know, 15, 20 pounds, dollars, whatever on music in a year, you know, if you can win those over, then you're doing well. But is the reality that, you know, consumers just aren't that fussed, you know, don't <laughs> value it as much. But it's, you know, it's, it's, there was this survey yesterday, wasn't there, that, that quizzed American drivers around paying for premium services, and overwhelmingly, they all just said, I'm all right, I'd, I'm quite happy with <laughs> AM or FM radio. You know, it's not, there isn't, yeah. uh, you know, it, it really, it, it suggested that they, were, they, they didn't see it as a problem that needed solving. No one was sat there going, ah, oh, you know, if only I could get rid of radio and have an on-demand service. So, you know, they're, they're not bothered in their, in their mm-hmm. cars. They're not bothered. And so... It, it's you know it, it 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 remains to be seen. It really does whether you know white van man or who you know the, the guy in the street, the the woman in the street who's just largely ambivalent, just wants to hear some good music. Whether they would settle for a slightly slightly more tailored radio system than than on demand, and that's where Pandora is interesting because if it went international, you could argue that it could pose a potential threat. And if the, if it if it poses a potential threat to the growth of other on-demand services, it it needs to be making a lot of money for people if it's going to cannibalise against those services, growth. Yeah. You know, if it, if it's if it's taking people out of Spotify uh, to to use Pandora and Pandora is not paying enough to the rights holders, then clearly there's a big problem. 
Yeah. Uh, Sophie, yeah. I was wondering, you know, it may be well beyond uh, sort of uh, the technicality, but I was just trying to think, I was thinking, thinking to myself, if Pandora did do direct deals with uh, labels for the master side of things uh, internationally, would they be able to then bypass, because the issue here in the UK is that the, the rates set by the PRS for uh, the uh, for internet radios, inter sort of semi-interactive internet radios like Pandora is, uh, are deemed to be too high for Pandora to ever be able to turn a profit here. So that's why they essentially uh, uh, closed the shop a few years ago and and uh, didn't come back. Uh, what is that by possible to an extent? I, I honestly don't know. I would have to check with the with the guys at the PRS. I don't know if you know any more than, well, than me. I don't know any more than you, that's for sure, Andrea. But what I think is, is um, interesting, and, and from your comments and also from Darren's, it's to, um, to, to see that indeed you have Pandora on one hand, which relies on those statutory rates or those collective licenses. And then you have a, another, other services such as Deezer and Spotify or Beats, uh, which are on demand, and they relying on the licenses that they have with each uh, record company and all the master owners yeah but when it when it uh, when you look at the user they don't really make such a difference between the two services uh, not that there's no difference but as darren said earlier um it's it's a listening experience in both cases and if you would want to be uh, to add another service to the list we could also look at youtube yeah. it is a listening experience so i think it's interesting to see how you have one of the most successful music service which is youtube another one which is extremely successful which is pandora and others that are uh, getting really successful which are on demand uh, fully on-demand streaming services but the licensing models behind those three kind of services are hugely hugely different yeah. and j why or, or which side of the line you fall into is sometimes um, you wonder if there is still a need or where are those differences coming from why would a interactive service and a non-interactive service be licensed in different ways? Is this still a relevant uh, criterion to use when you look at licensing models? And now that we see all the uh, listening experience, which is converging to a base, one big listening experience that you can tailor in different ways, um, should not sh i mean is it not time to try to look at all those music services and to try to make sure that there's some kind of um, a more fairer ground and to make sure that they all have to be licensed in a way which is more similar or do we have to continue to live with those huge discrepancies between how those services are being licensed yeah um, i think that's really the question that's a great point, and, and I think you know you're absolutely right in that. In, in a lot of a lot of the times, when you look at mainstream articles, perhaps some of the articles that maybe Stuart Dredge puts on the Guardian or, or uh, um, uh, other publications put on, on more so mainstream uh, news sites, uh, you look at the comments, and a lot of times people confuse uh, different services that operate on wildly different models for one another and sort of compare them, and it's it's kind of comparing uh, apples and pears. But at the same time, people don't perceive that as being a difference, and, and maybe that that is an issue for them. Absolutely. So, yeah, uh, very interesting stuff. Uh, I want to move on. Uh, we'll come back to talk about copyright in a little uh, while and we'll talk about the uh, e EU copyright directive. But first, uh, something a bit lighter. And uh, uh, once again, we'll return to uh, sort of... Uh, uh, <laughs> I, I, you know, I can't help it. I have to go back to Tidal every now and again because it feels like, uh, uh, you know, the, the go-to story of the last couple of months. And uh, uh, Jay-Z seemed like he couldn't take it any longer. Too, too much criticism of the platform over the last few weeks. And he started sort of a, a bit of a Twitter storm by uh, publishing a bunch of tweets uh, with the hashtag uh, Tidal Facts. Uh, and I wonder if he wrote them down first and then put them on Tidal or how sort of he went about actually uh, getting those points across. Uh, uh, and, and they sort of created a two different reactions. So my reaction initially was sort of, I was annoyed by the tweets just because I could see the gaps in the reasoning uh, right off the bat. Uh, you know, f starting from the fact that they were claiming, you know, 750,000 uh, 
uh, users, uh, no, 70,000 users, uh, uh, which you know didn't specify whether those users were actually users inherited from uh, WIMP, which was the parent service of Tidal, or were actually new users that that had been acquired uh, over the last four weeks uh, from when the new service was launched. Uh, you know, to the fact that they were talking about you know a, a smear campaign and companies paying millions of dollars to sort of smear them, which uh, I don't think there was any way to substantiate because all the criticism that I saw was on on publications that are pretty much independent. I, I couldn't see any sort of uh, money changing hands for the criticism that were being waged against against the company. And so sort of on the one hand, I was annoyed about that. On the other hand, I've, I've also seen a lot of people talk about the fact that maybe people are being too hard on the company and that they should give them a chance uh, and, and it is great to have some more competition, which is a point that I also see. Uh, but I, I just I just kind of get annoyed at these tweets that are so generic and, and, and to, to a certain extent inaccurate. I don't know, Darren, what, how do you feel about this? Uh, do you think that there is too much criticism? Uh, but at the same time, should they just kind of shut up now and, and, and work on this rather than and keep trying to PR, PR their way out of out of this mess. Yeah, I mean, I I, I think they do need to step away now and, uh, and and have a long think about what they're saying because they're just offering far too many weak arguments that are far too simple to pick holes in. You know, the, yeah. I read earlier that you know they've been making much of the fact that you know any artist can get their music on Tidal, but when pushed on this, it turns out that really what they're talking about is using TuneCore and other such services to, to supply things. And, and this is a sort of recurring theme with Tidal where they make bold claims that really, when push comes to shove, don't appear to, none, none of it is anything that doesn't apply elsewhere. Anyone can put a CD via TuneCore and be on pretty much every DMS going. Yeah. You know, you can be on Spotify, that's not a problem. And equally, you know, they're talking about paying out sort of 75%, but they don't really say 75% of what <laughs> you know they're, they're, they're saying we pay out 75 percent, but it's just a very you know hollow statement it doesn't without a very clear sense of you know what do they pay out per stream yeah. which should be well could be uh, a fixed amount and obviously then it gets shot through the prism of you know everyone taking their piece so the label and you know all the rights holders and uh, but they should still be approximately able to to you know, shed light on these things. But at every opportunity where they've had that means to actually say something meaningful, sadly, they just seem to um, to come out with a, a, a you know a fairly bad load of hyperbole. So I do feel that they should maybe go away and and come back when they have something uh, slightly more substantial. You know, and it's it's just the old actions speak louder than words thing, really. Yeah. I, I mean, I think Tidal's presence in the market is good. It's interesting because it's it's been it's been, well, it's been largely a one horse race. I think, if we're all honest, uh, you know, as much as Deezer and Audio are, are, are there in the marketplace, I don't think any have come close to threatening Spotify. And then you had a two horse race with iTunes, but I think you know, Tidal and the star power behind it certainly has got a, an opportunity to shake things up. And as much as it's easy at the moment, because Tidal keep giving them, you know, they keep feeding us the rope with which to hang them. Um, it's easy to give them a pretty good kicking at the moment because they, they, they're just offering that up. But the reality is that their ability to split the market a little bit more yeah. uh, does make things more interesting. And, you know, uh, uh, I, I've been fairly critical of them to date. And I, I, equally, I think justifiably so. Yes, um, <laughs> absolutely. But that does not mean that we should entirely write them off and, and, and all those sorts of things. I think there's plenty of opportunity for them to do slightly more meaningful things. But I, I, I just think at the moment, their strategy of kind of talking a lot of hot air, it, which really, sadly, is, is what it, it feels like it amounts to at this particular point, um, that strategy does not work. And the whole big launch with the Megan artists, I think, equally did not work. And they were almost looking at the wrong end of the spectrum. Yeah. Um, so, you know, they've just put their f foot wrong uh, on a, <laughs> a number of occasions, <laughs> but it could still turn around, you know, yeah. and, and I think there are gaps where they could certainly shake things up. Um, I, I have to say, I still feel, uh, perhaps I'm being cynical, that, you know, Jay-Z is an investor. Uh, he's given equity to the other artists to ensure that they're part of this. Uh, he's leveraging Rock Nation and everything he can to try and get people on there to the point where you even had that bizarre moment of a boxing match being streamed over Tidal because yeah. Rock Nation was sponsoring it. Um, I was so confused by that. 
Yeah, it was a completely random, right? But, you know, within all of that, I just feel like this is clearly about building the value and, and making it something that I would imagine at some point, probably Apple or Spotify are going to have to buy out of the game. Yeah. You know, so that, that, you know, the ideal thing for Jay Z would be, you know, a $500 million exit where it's a tenfold lift on what he paid. Uh, everyone exits with a, a good load of money. And they're all happy. Yeah. Um, I think that's the end goal. And, and in the face of that, the sort of persistent talk of artist rights and things, you know, I get it. But I, 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 in cold light of day, I suspect this is much more about the money than, uh, than anything else. Yeah. Uh, Sophie, uh, it, this is also a testament to the fact that it is actually not possible to pick up a company and within four weeks uh, pretend to come out and essentially relaunch the company with a whole mission statement philosophy uh, organization behind it that is actually structured in a way that makes sense i mean it's just it's even yeah. if you have a team of 100 people it's just not possible to put that together in a way that is cohesive right yeah i mean i would agree with you on that le last point that um, if there's something we can hold against uh, the new title is that maybe things were a little bit rushed yeah. And I think that's the feeling I had when I looked at the press release. It's like it felt like it hadn't been rehearsed. Uh, it felt like it had been put together in a kind of in a rush. Um, and, and that it should have been a little more tailored. It could have been, maybe they could have done it differently. Uh, but apart from that, uh, I have to say that I belong to the list of people who think that they should be given a chance. Right. And I... I I, I disagree that the only thing they have in mind is to um, sell it for uh, 10 or 20 times the amount of money that they put to buy it. Um, I may be wrong, but um, that's not the impression that I have. And actually, um, I think the intentions are pure. I, I, I am a little bit surprised that everybody would think that um, it's just a bunch of rich people wanting to get richer. Because I've never heard anyone criticizing uh, the founder of Facebook or uh, Daniel Ek or um, other uh, big people in the uh, social media or the tech space uh, being rich. They, they are millionaires too. And no one seems to um, really hold it against them. Yeah, but that was their objective all along, right? Whilst in this case, they're sort of trying to mask it through sort of philosophical arguments that this is just a great thing well, for I artists. Believe, I believe the philosophical uh, arguments are, um, are not just philosophical. I believe right. there is a, 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 an intention, at least, to deliver on those arguments. Then how to deliver on those arguments is a very tricky question. And I think that's the reason why maybe it, will, it does sound like a little bit of hot, hot air at the moment. It's, um, they just acquired the company they also have all the relationship with the uh, master owners and they have all the the contracts and all the those relationships that they can't really um uh, what i'm trying to say is the room for maneuver right now is probably very early days for them they're yeah. probably tr still trying to get their heads around how they will be able to really deliver on the intentions but nonetheless the intentions are there and uh, before everybody buries them i think uh, they should be given a chance to deliver on them yeah i agree that maybe it would be a good thing if they uh, go away and then come back with some kind of real uh, statements and something a little more concrete but uh, i still believe they they there is probably something uh, and i'm optimistic yeah uh, and as for the tweets what it looks to me, at least, is, is that it's an attempt to be a little more humble about what Tidal is trying to achieve. And I've, what I read in those tweets is, a, is an attempt to calm everyone's, uh, calm a little bit what the, the storm that has been uh, started yeah. around Tidal and, and just to, um, yeah, to, to demonstrate the goodwill. Um, I don't know if there's a lot more they can do in such a small amount of time right now, but I'm, I'm still very optimistic uh, and I really want to give them a chance.
to deliver. Absolutely, and it's great to hear uh, uh, both sides of the coin. And, and also, you know, I, I appreciate what they're trying to do. I, I know it's difficult to market these services, especially as Tidal started out as a premium service. And, uh, you know, I loved the demo where when I was sent the demo uh, early on before, before it came out. And uh, uh, I told everybody about it and I told them that, uh, you know, the quality was good and everything else. And then the first marketing video that came out of Tidal was this like really uh, horrid sort of... Uh, um, madman type uh, uh, marketing campaign that was aimed uh, ex exclusively at men uh, because you know title was the the service that the executive needs because you know the executive needs uh, the highest quality and it was kind of it was uh, it was just bizarre because it was essentially just it's a service for men that like high quality sound and have expensive headphones and that was essentially the advert for it and, and again a, a misstep uh, and this was like months before the acquisition happened uh, a misstep but uh, again driven by the fact that they were probably trying to figure out who the hell to market the service to uh, rather than uh, anything else or any sort of uh, uh, overt attempt to uh, be somehow sexist, sexist or anything uh, so yeah it's it's interesting to see sort of these services try and make their way into the world and figure out how to uh, market themselves uh, and I think we'll you know uh, with the advent of, of uh, high quality solutions from, from Deezer Elite as well. And I'm sure Spotify probably has got something in the works uh, uh, for the next few months, uh, I would imagine. Uh, we're going to see a lot more of that and, and uh, seeing how people sort of balance those, those uh, different factors together. Um, uh, Sophie, I wanted to uh, chat with you a little bit about, uh, and also obviously involve Darren in the conversation, about the European Commission's uh, 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 latest uh, leaks. Uh, so essentially uh, what happened is that uh, you know uh, we were all expecting uh, this uh, sort of uh, uh, digital single market initiative to, to happen, uh, but it looked uh, like uh, uh, the announcements were actually uh, quite a long way away as to how the European, European Commission was actually going to tackle uh, this idea of uh, uh, removing Moving geo blocks and 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 and, 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 and geo limits uh, across the border in the European Union. And obviously, this had created a lot of uproar uh, amongst uh, uh, copyright holders uh, uh, that uh, don't want this to happen. Uh, and uh, uh, there was actually a, a political pol uh, political EU leak uh, uh, last week that showed uh, actually some of the arguments that were being uh, prepared by the European Commission uh, around this uh, single uh, sing uh, digital single market initiative. Uh, so, Sophie, on, on your and uh, uh, can you explain to us a little bit how uh, do you think these uh, comments uh, uh, or leaks uh, change the outlook uh, uh, that perhaps we had before of how this is going to play out? Yeah, sure. I mean, to, to address that point, I think it's good to have some context first. Of course, yeah. And ju so the, the overall context uh, is, is um, n not really difficult to understand, but you still need to go back a little bit in time and, and remember that the actual directive that we have, which is governing copyright at European level, dates back from 2001. Right. And already in 2001, the aim of that directive was to harmonize certain aspects of copyright and of neighboring rights. Um, the problem that we have is that the directive in 2001 didn't do such uh, a great job at harmonizing just uh, for one simple reason is that um, the compromise that was found at the time made only one point, uh, if I'm trying to s just get it simple, sure. one point was compulsory. There was only one exception to copyright that had to be implemented by all 28 member states uh, and all the rest has been made optional, right. which very much means that we still have, as of today, 28 member states and 28 different copyright laws in Europe, whereas some elements more or less looking very much similar in every uh, member state, but it's still very scattered. Um, the idea is to reopen the conversation about copyright in Europe to enable more harmonization and especially in the light of all the European services in the internet world that are struggling to become pan-European. So I think there's been a study showing that only 4% of European services, digital services, are cross-border. It's a ridiculously small number of services. Uh, on the other hand, you see that um, uh, and yeah, I mean, on the other hand, you see services such as uh, uh, Netflix, for example, which doesn't have that problem. And 
I guess some would say they are the American services are doing much better in Europe than some European services are doing. Yeah. Um, and that's the whole um, one of the big debates which is now happening at European level is is obviously to try to harmonize more copyright aspects so that European services would be able to uh, be cross-border, to have portability, to be able to deliver um, across frontiers. And, um, and that's very much the reason why they want to reopen the copyright directive. And it's being pushed by the tech industry, it's being pushed by the digital service providers. On the other hand, the content owners and the rights owners are um, very worried they do not feel that there is a need to reopen the directive right now. And they think that they are local markets and that every market has got its own specificities and that there is a need to keep copyright uh, local. Right. So what we can see right now is that there's both sides of the arg argument. And then there's a third party, which are the users and, and all the um, unions and bodies and entities which are uh, representing users that also want to have a say in that conversation and they also um, want to add something and they are requesting more uh, certainty for example they want to know when it's okay to do a private copy as of today the uh, status of private copying is different in every member state almost. Yeah. So if I do a private copy in the UK, it's probably not going to be, ex I, I don't have the exact same rights <laughs> yeah. than I would have in France. And for someone like me who spent my time between Paris and London, um, it sounds a little bit silly that um, I would have that uncertainty depending on w what country do I do the copy in. Yeah. Uh, so that's very much the whole idea behind the reopening of those uh, debate. And, and it's part, as you said, of a strategy for the single digital market. So what we know, so it's been now two years that this reopening of the copyright directive, or at least of the conversation around the copyright directive has been decided. But we now have an agenda. So we know that on the 6th of May, we should be hearing the digital strategy of European Union for the single uh, digital market. Right. And we also know that we should have by September the draft of the copyright reform. So what is exactly that the Commission has in mind when they say that they want to harmonize and to reduce the differences between the copyright laws in the 28 member states? Because what was really... Um, noticeable in the documents that were leaked. So the documents that were leaked are the documents that will be uh, the basis of the announce, uh, announcements that are going to be make, made on the 6th of May. Right. So, so it's the guidelines as to what is the um, agenda for the digital single market. Uh, and when it gets to the copyright issues, or, or, um, they say that they want to reduce the differences between national copyright regimes. They say they want to include the uh, full portability of services, that they want to enhance access to legally paid for cross-border online services. So it looks like we are going to have a conversation which will be very similar to the one we had in 2001 when the uh, first copyright directive was adopted. Right. And so, and so, this is uh, obviously like, uh, uh, and you know, as I mentioned earlier, actually, you know, I, I thought this was this leaks actually pertain some of the some of the September announcements, but obviously, this was much closer announcement that is going to happen at the be beginning of May, and obviously, we're going to keep a close eye on this and see see what happens on that front uh, from the European Union. Uh, Darren, you know, obviously, you're in touch with a lot of, of rights holders uh, uh, all the time. Have you heard any grumblings at all from your end as to as to this? Because obviously, the people that are seem to be most scared about this this new harmonization are uh, labels. And, and rice holders that are worried that the value of their product uh, is going to decrease because of this harmonization? Um, no, in no. a word. I'm Nobody not, cares. Not, yeah, no, <laughs> well, fair I'm, enough. Just, 
I wouldn't really be party to those discussions. Sure. You know, it's um, um, uh, within the structure of labels and everything else. This is a, a conversation that would take place on a on a slightly different level um, than the one that I would necessarily be particularly involved in. Um, but it, I mean, it just it, you know, it's like all these areas around the music and the payouts and the rights and everything else. It's just a it's a horribly complicated area that feels rather like a catch-22 at this point. But it is difficult because I think as the Pandora discussion that we just had illustrates, you know, something's got to give. Right. It's just, you know, it just, it can't continue. And, you know, there's, you know, it, even the, the disparity that seems to be getting uh, a lot of press at the moment between what songwriters are paid out compared to rights holders. You know, there's all these kinds of things going on. Um and they're just illustrating that there is, uh, you know, a, a desperately complicated uh, setup at the moment, which if the music industry is not going to try and force a change on itself, you know, you, you may well then see things like this, you know, unified initiative coming in and in a bid to address that. Yeah. Um, and and it's, a, it's a good example, I think, where, it, you know, the music industry and indeed other creative industries and, and such like, may well want to consider policing themselves uh, a little more to avoid, you know, a, a, an intervention at a higher level that might well uh, d considerably disadvantage them. Yeah, yeah. No, you're absolutely right. And also, you know, we have to take into account uh, as well the fact that uh, whilst I, maybe I, a few... Sorry, go ahead. Sorry, Sophie, do you want to say something? Uh yeah, no, just to the point that Darren was making, uh, um, and when you were asking if, if any artist was talking about this, um, I do think that artists should indeed probably uh, keep an eye on all of that and have a say. And I believe that they are uh, getting together as we speak to be able to uh, add their voice to the debate. So I think we should be hearing from artists in the weeks and months to come uh, much more on that on that side and also you know I, I was going to say that uh, one other thing that we need to keep in mind on, on the wider sort of way that people are consuming uh, content online is the fact that people that maybe three or th two or three years ago I would have never even contemplated uh, that they had a VPN account now all appear to have a VPN account uh, so you've even super non techy people uh, that I know that do things that have nothing to do with music or digital or technology they all have a VPN account and they all pay their you know two or three bucks a month uh, to uh, be able to watch content in the US or, or to uh, watch Netflix when they're on holiday in Spain or all that kind of stuff. And so, you know, on that front, it just kind of feels like the, 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 the fact that the VPNs are going mainstream it, it adds even more pressure perhaps to content uh, owners to allow for some kind of reform to happen on, on that front and, and, and perhaps it's time for this to, to happen. I think the Netflix situation is certainly interesting. You know, there's been m more discussion of late about the degree to which Netflix should crack down on the VPN users but I think this is where again the, you know the creative industries can run a serious risk of losing public support on any level yeah if you know if, if they were to then enforce this crackdown and kick off anyone accessing via a VPN it would just lead to a massive resurgence in piracy you know, and you look around, that's what everyone says. Like, if I get kicked off of the VPN for Netflix, I'm straight back to the Pirate Bay. And But those things, you know, just, they, they equally, they do nothing to help the general discourse around this subject. Because if Joe Public just thinks that these companies and these people are all being horrifically greedy because they just misunderstand the situation, it doesn't help anybody. Yeah. And... Uh, and, 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 you know, and, and it does worry me greatly because I think we've had this so much in music where there was, you know, just a fundamental view that artists, labels, everyone involved was greedy and, you know, didn't deserve the money, didn't deserve anything. And, you know, they've all got millions and all this kind of nonsense. It just doesn't help, um, you know, and, and it's it's a, it's a strange thing that this is a sort of PR battle that no one's ever really tried to take on. Yeah. And you still get these situations where artists complain, you know, and the Tidal thing, to some extent, is a, is a great case in point, you know, is it's just, it was broadly misunderstood by most people, or, or one could even argue it was perfectly, perfectly <laughs> understood well that it was a bunch of very wealthy <laughs> artists saying they deserve more money, but, you know, it, um, it did not help, and yeah. it's very interesting when you then look around to these other places like Reddit and where there's a general conversation about this stuff among Joe Public, um, 
to then learn that these people are just saying, look, you know, stuff these guys. You know, we're not interested. They're just rich people trying to get richer. And, you know, and as long as those views persist, it just doesn't help anybody. No. So I think within that, as I said, the need for the, for the industry to police itself more uh, is really quite strong. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Sophie, we were talking also yeah, about... It's quite crazy to see... Sorry. Crazy sure, to see how the industry is still uh, not understood that being user-friendly is really uh, where it should go. Yeah. Yeah, and I guess, you know, we were talking the other day about the fact that perhaps, uh, uh, you know, there are some instances where, and I think the Copyright Directive will take those into account, where uh, allowing cross-border uh, uh, access is problematic. For example, for free services, you know, uh, like the uh, BBC iPlayer, we were talking about the fact that in the UK, theoretically, people that use the iPlayer, even though that's not always the case, they should have a TV license as well to, to, to back that up. And if it was open for access from anybody in Europe, obviously, uh, it would create problems because that's paid by a UK taxpayer and so how would you police that and would you have to then create a login system that would only allow people that do pay the TV license to access the iPlayer and so it could become a bit of a bit of a headache on that front but uh, you know do, do, uh, Sophie do you foresee any other issues around that in, in this area? Well, no, I think you've really touched the point. The money is one of the biggest issues and not only the money as you d just described and there is so many different ways in many different countries in Europe to um, help what the culture and to subsidize some um, in France for example the, the um, audiovisual in industry works in a very unique way and there's a lot of money which is injected in the audiovisual sector yeah. to uh, encourage the creation in France you mentioned the iPlayer and the BBC there's also the BBC is funded in a unique way which is very different from the way other um, public services are funded in Europe and so that is one of the main reason why the, the reluctance from the content owners or from, from the uh, uh, TV services is that in order to allow cross-border access you need to rethink the whole system onto which it uh, relies so uh, you need to think about how is it going to be financed who's going to pay for it how is it going to be paid for and and that can get really really complex and yeah. uh, there's really not an easy answer and that's probably why uh, it hasn't happened yet yeah yeah, that's it's not surprising that this is going to take a, a long time to figure out because even if there was some sort of directive that was passed on, uh, as we know, it takes a long time for that directive to then trickle down into into uh, actual legislation from the individual territories. And so, uh, it, it, but it's good to see this happen because even though it might be years before anything concrete happens, you know, at least uh, uh, there there are the seeds here of of something. Uh, at least the problem is being uh, looked at at the moment. And uh, you know, for example, I know that in Italy it's it's a nightmare. You know, my, I had to get my parents uh, uh, the only service essentially that is similar to Netflix in Italy which is called uh, Infinity uh, I think the only other offering is uh, given by Sky if you're a subscriber uh, and which is owned by, I believe it's owned by Berlusconi which wasn't my uh, happiest time having to subscribe to that uh, for them but it was the only way that they could access uh, 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 sort of a Netflix, Netflix like experience from from their home uh, because Netflix essentially said we're launching in France and in a bunch of other places but Italy is so complicated mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, full of issues from a rights perspective that we're not even going to go there uh, we're not even announcing that we might go there at some point uh, for now so yeah it's 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 a shame that some countries are held back by their uh, sort of uh, uh, convoluted legislation on the, on the rights front and hopefully we're going to see a little bit of progress around that uh, I wanted to end the show by talking about live music uh, and the great news from the company uh, Jukli, uh, which has closed uh, an $8 million round uh, led by North Zone and 14W with the participation of Lior Cohen, Larry Marcus, Harry Nada, Steve Martocci and Jared Hecht. Uh, the company has been around for uh, a couple of years. It started out as a way to match people up that uh, uh, wanted to attend uh, the same concert but they didn't want to go by themselves and, and obviously were uh, strangers before and met up at the concert. Uh, and then it kind of shifted into uh, a more uh, subscription type service uh, and it's mo most popular service is now the Jukli Unlimited product which allows fans to subscribe for uh, 25 to 45 dollars depending on whether you want to go by yourself or with somebody else uh, per month and you can go to as many gigs as you as you like that are put uh, that are sort of included in the Jukli offering uh, you know a lot of the gigs obviously are from uh, 
new artists uh, but there are there have also been a lot of uh, gigs from uh, well-known artists like you know Skrillex, Marilyn Manson, Erasure and a bunch of others. It's only a US service for, for now uh, and it's uh, present in 10 cities. It started out in New York City uh, but hopefully we're going to see it come up in Europe uh, as well after this fundraise and so uh, obviously a new way to fund live music that we haven't seen before uh, which kind of goes alongside the Spotify model but in a very different way to attend the live events. Uh, uh, Darren, do, do you think that this could catch on in London and, and, uh, and how do you feel about this particular way of consuming gigs? Um, I must admit, initially I was, I was a little bit kind of sceptical. Um, but it, it's funny because I think sometimes it's just trying to wrap your head around the mechanics of it. Yeah. And actually what it made me, what it brought to mind for me was things like The Great Escape where it's a three-day event and you buy a kind of wristband that pretty much lets you wander in and out of any of the gigs that are going on. And I think it's an interesting situation because if you've ever been to those sorts of things, um, it does sort of make you more likely to tr chance your arm on different gigs and things yeah. like that. And, you you know, you're, you, you, um, you know, as long as the price is right, which I suppose is the caveat, uh, then, it, you know, it, it makes you more likely to take a, a punt on... Um, on bands that are playing and things like that. And I think that actually is a very interesting dynamic, you know, where people would say, oh, well, we can get in, you know, I mean, it's that thing where in your head you see it as getting in for free because you're only paying 20 quid or something, you know, basically the price of one gig. So then, in theory, you could do 30 in a month or whatever, you know. And I, I, I think there's, there's a lot to be said for that. It's an interesting model, um, you know, will it take off? Like everything, it remains to be seen. But I, I, yeah, I think there's there's something pretty interesting about the notion that you can, you, you know, take in any number of gigs that might be happening on that night or anything like that. Because I think there is just an element of perhaps it not being so much about music and more about cheap nights out. Right. Um, in the sense that you can go to the gig, you know, and see a band, and it's a night out, and for twenty quid, if you can do ten of those a month, if you are yeah. uh, y younger and more energetic than I am. <laughs> then um, you know you you would <laughs> and me you, you would love that you know yeah so it's i, I think it's a it's a smart idea I'm and that's something curious that curious to see what will come of it and it's, the music industry hasn't really done uh itself any favors there because obviously we're, we're seeing if you go on something like white plan you see hundreds of uh uh uh, open mic uh, sort of comedy nights and all sorts of uh, comedy nights from terrible ones to, to pretty good ones but you see very very few independent artist gigs or even normal artist gigs so the only ones that are advertised are the ones by very very well, well known names uh, that cost you know uh, uh, between anywhere between 40 and, and, and 100 pounds uh, mm. so yeah it's interesting that they could kind of wedge themselves in that sort of Y plan market uh, but uh, uh, appeal mostly to music fans uh, yeah I mean I think it's it's got some legs on it my only concern is how it how it it integrates with the bigger picture of doing the gigs like if yeah. you know if if you're a band that's taking part in this how, are you then solely reliable on subscribers to attend or can people buy on the door and if so how is that managed in a in a demand capacity you know what i mean like there, yeah. there might be a gig where suddenly a, a, every subscriber in london wants to go to that gig but it's exactly, only got 100 yeah, yeah. capacity and uh, uh, so that logistical bit i'm slightly unclear on but i'm sure there's a way of yeah. solving it I, i'm pretty sure i mean they must have already uh, arranged this in new york uh, uh, they, they must have some sort of like first first come first serve thing because yeah. otherwise it just doesn't make sense because i would imagine obviously you know would have you would have maybe like 30 40 tickets left over that you might want to give to uh, you know the subscribers of the service and you know they announce the gigs maybe two or three days earlier in advance and people sign up that want to go it's almost like going to uh, a gym class why did i think gym class such a weird comparison <laughs> well <laughs> but that, a, that's what came one. that's what came to me so that's that's what i'm sticking with uh, sophie from your from your point of view how, how do you feel about about this uh, uh, this new way of tackling live and can it can it sort of solve a problem for promoters as well of filling out some gigs that perhaps wouldn't have sold out yeah I mean I think the com comparison with the gym club is actually excellent because uh, I, I uh, really like the model and I I think it goes to the same point um, that access is probably what people want now and convenience uh, and to have that kind of subscription model where you can have a, a limited access to all those gigs is something really comfortable and um, something probably where people see a lot of value in. So uh, I could completely uh, see um, 
people adopting this service um, quite easily. Yeah. And what I can see as well is that if the service takes off, there's probably going to be a lot of comparison to draw with a good old streaming service. Yeah. Um, what show to choose from? That um, eternal problem of the tyranny of choice. If all of a sudden I have more than 25 gigs in London that I can choose from for one single night, uh, and if I'm interested in discovering new music, which one am I going to pick and to the element of uh, curation is probably going to grow and be become central to um, a service like that and yeah. I would be interested to see how it does and I really hope that they're going to launch in London because I think it's a really interesting model yeah I'm excited uh, as, well. as for the the um, uh, the way it's going to work for the promoters um, I believe it's very uh, likely that they will have a number of seats that is going to be allocated to the service and when when that number is gone uh there's probably um not going to be possible to get in the gig yeah i mean i and, would imagine and and you'll have to go through the more traditional ways of buying tickets yeah, absolutely. And, and I, I, I congratulate the guys there for uh, being able to pull it off. It's obviously not easy to organize a service like this logistically and keep subscribers happy. And it seems like subscribers are happy at the moment, uh, which is good. And hopefully we'll see it come up in London because uh, uh, going out for live music on a regular basis can be extremely expensive. Uh, and so uh, it'd be good to have sort of a, something else that comes up uh, that you can uh, sort of go to on a, on a regular basis, even if you don't end up going to uh, The Great Escape or South by uh, every year and well that's uh, pretty much all for this week I think we've run out of time but uh, guys uh, thanks so much for your time uh, uh, Sophie and thanks so much for your time Darren uh, once again uh, go and check out uh, uh, Motive Unknown's website on motiveunknown.com you can find out everything about what they are doing and Darren you were starting out a podcast but is the first step is it out yet or not <laughs> y yes the the first podcast is out oh, we excellent. did it and then Great. um we we recorded it and then i think we're we're a little suspect as to whether it was uh uh the, the you know the, let's just say there's some candid conversations in there. right uh so, so you didn't it advertise is, it hugely yeah it is online but we kept it a little bit quiet and then since then um i, I got kind of ill and there were things that had just prevented yeah, sure. yeah, yeah. uh doing another one but there there is a plan to do it um uh, uh, yeah so it will uh, it will restart but the idea was that it was very much a monthly thing, thing and uh is in no way as intelligent as as dmt oh no don't um so it was, <laughs> don't it was <laughs> yeah i think that well what, put it this way it's, one of the uh, conversations about restarting it involved potentially just recording it in i just pub. get i just get intelligent <laughs> people on the show i don't i don't do anything i'm <laughs> <laughs> you flatter yourself come on now come on. i just sit here and i can't Be even move my that, neck mate. this week because uh, <laughs> of, 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 of a of a training injury uh, and sophie on your side uh, you know is there anywhere that people should be ch checking out to know more about about what you're working on and, and, and perhaps get in touch if they want to? Um, yeah, well, checking out what I'm working on is a little bit difficult yes, because obviously. of my uh, <laughs> of <your work>. job. <laughs> yes. But you can definitely contact me on Twitter, which is Sophie underscore Goosens uh, on Twitter. And I'll, I'll, I'll throw that link in the show notes as well. And it's going to be in the uh, video version of the show too. Uh, well, thanks so much for your time once again. And thanks so much for listening. I will put together a compendium. A compendium, that's a good word, isn't it? Uh, for of uh, d digital music uh, uh, podcasts uh, uh, that are uh, as an alternative uh, to DMT uh, over the next couple of weeks. Uh, there's been a couple of uh, interesting relaunches. Uh, I know that the, the, the guest we had last week has a, has a new music industry podcast. So there's definitely options to choose from if you are uh, gonna feel withdrawal after the, the show uh, stops uh, uh, broadcasting on with such regularity thanks you so much for listening and uh, once again this week have a fantastic week and uh, till next time 